Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Let me again take the time out to welcome us to another session of Bible study. We you know, deeply appreciate the fact that you have been with us from the start. We have been looking at the seven dispensation, right? And we left the last time we were talking about the dispensation of conscience. And we had actually completed the dispensation of conscience. And now we are on the, going on to the dispensation of human government. Let me take the time out first of all to say welcome you all to another session. And, you know, we pray that, you know, you would have been edified. We pray that as, you know, we speak tonight that, you know, you would have learned something. You would have gained something. You would have grown spiritually. And, you know, we pray most of all that the will of the Lord be done. But welcome again, and let us read a word of prayer before we proceed. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bless your great name. We thank you for your love and your mercies. Mighty God, you are great, you are holy, you are righteous, you are perfect in all your ways. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for what you will be doing. As we get in the word again tonight, we ask God that you will be on the medium. We ask God that you speak to every individual. We ask God that as the words go forth, you will cause them to accomplish what they will. Lord, we pray that you will edify your people and we ask that you will do like only you alone can. Let your perfect will be done as we give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, let me say welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Amen. So, like I was saying, the last time we spoke, we spoke on the dispensation of conscience, right? We did um, about two weeks on the dispensation of conscience. And the last time we were here, we looked at, you know, what it is that we could learn from the dispensation. We talk about, you know, what we look at, the, 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 the negatives of Cain, and we look at, you know, what we can do. How is it that we can learn? How is it that we can please the Lord? No. Cain wanted to serve God on his own will. He wanted to do his own thing. You know, there was a requirement of God that you would offer blood sacrifice. But Cain, he brought forth the, the ground provision, the things from the ground to offer unto God. And his brother Abel offered unto God what was accepted. Abel's offering was accepted, but Cain's offering was rejected. And for that, Cain got angry, right? And we made the point last time that, you know, we cannot, you know, give God what we think that God deserves. Um, we should try and give God what God really deserves. And if any one of us truly desire to serve God, you know, the thing that we can do is to try to please God as best as possible. Give him what he wants. God is not interested in 50%. He's not interested in 75%. But God wants everything. He wants to be in total control. Amen, somebody. So, so Cain wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to give God what he wanted to give God. But God was saying, that is not what I want. Right? You have to abide by what I say. You have to give me what it is that I require. Then Cain slew his brother. Again, that speaks to brotherly love. Where was the brotherly love? When God came to him, he said, am I my brother's keeper? You can imagine somebody saying to God, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord did not act. He did not judge Cain when Cain you know, offered what he wanted to do. But when Cain, when Cain slew his brother, that was the time God acted. And Cain him cry and him say, boy, look here, this is too much for me, too much for me to bear. But, you know, we ended and we say that God is a just God, meaning that God will hand out the reward that is, is due. So if your works are good, if your works are good, God will hand out the reward to you. And if your works are evil, God will again give you what you deserve. Yes, God will not, you will not deserve bad so to speak, and God give you all of the blessing. You know, he's going to give you what you truly deserve. And I want us as individuals to bear this in mind as we serve God, that God is just and he is righteous in all 
his judgment. Amen. So tonight we want to look at the dispensation of human government, right? And we want to remember we have been doing, looking at the dispensation in a particular way. We said that we wanted to cover the dispensation in seven points, right? And the beginning of the dispensation, we want to look at the beginning of the dispensation and what happened at that time. We want to look at point two, what is the command that was given in the dispensation, who were involved. We wanted to look at the failure to obey God's command because in each dispensation, as we go down the line, you're going to recognize that Man tends to fail when it comes to following the command of God. And even as we get into the dispensation of human government, you're going to realize how simple a task it was for man to do. And man failed even to do that. You know, there is just something about the fallen man, you know, that he just tends to go against everything, you know, God requires of him. And then now we want to look at the judgment that is handed out. So man always feel God hand out a judgment, right? And point five is really the mode of deliverance or the mode of salvation. Like we said, in every dispensation, there is a mode of salvation. We look at one or two to take away for this dispensation tonight. We will look at only one takeaway, one thing that stands out. And we just want to speak about that, right? And... The seventh point, we want to look at what it is that we can learn about the Lord, right? So those are all of the points that we try to cover as we look at each dispensation. If we did not do it this way, brethren, I'm telling you next year, this time, probably we'd still be here, right, talking about the dispensation. So we have to put in the guideline, you know, to guide us in our discussion. Amen. So we're looking at point one now, the beginning of the dispensation. Right? And this is the dispensation of human government. We're looking at who were involved in the dispensation and what the dispensation is all about. Human government is the third dispensation, and it is we can find it in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 to chapter 11, verse 9. Right? So that's where it starts, that's where it ends in the Bible. Right. Surely there are other scriptures that mention about, you know, things that happen during this time. But, you know, this is where you can get the reading of human government. Right. The stewards of the dispensation are Noah and his descendants. So everybody that pertained to Noah is sons, his sons, sons, his grandchildren, great grand, whoever they were. These are the stewards of the dispensation. The dispensation um run from the flood after the flood to the confusion of tongues at babel right about 429 years the dispensation lasted so i look just a little bit of, of added information right the people had a responsibility to scatter and multiply that was that is found in genesis chapter 9 and the people feel or uh, the people refuse to scatter and build they build a tower and we are going to get into it and we're going to look at the judgment, and we're going to look at the deliverance, and we're going to look at the individual that God would select to continue in the new dispensation. Amen. So, let's go back to the other slide. After, so after, after God worked face to face, yes, yeah, so with the stewards, after God worked face to face with Adam and Eve, he communed with them in the cool of the day, right? Adam and he, they were in the dispensation of innocence, and we went through that. We recognize that even after all of that, they were in the presence of God, that they still ended up in sin. They fell, right? And because they fell, all mankind after that would, would, would burn under this curse. The planet was cursed, the earth was cursed, right? God said, cursed be the ground, and all the condition after that change all the families on earth after that change right and based on what we knew in the dispensation of conscience so mankind feel in the first dispensation and now they in the dispensation of conscience again as we went through they feel mankind 
feeling their responsibility. So God brought a worldwide flood to wipe out all mankind and then now only eight people and all the animals that were on the ark were saved. God worked now in a new way with mankind and this way is through human government. So this is the third dispensation and it is called the dispensation of human government. Right? It is called this way because it is called this way because it is the age in which humans are privileged to govern himself. From the days of Noah and down to the eight, through the ages and extended even until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mankind lives under human government. Let us go to the passage. Genesis chapter 8. 14 to 21. Genesis chapter 8, 14 to 21. So we're looking out now at the, let us go to the next slide. We can look at the command that was given and what was expected of man. Right? So, that is just an introduction that we have gone through a while ago to the dispensation. So mankind feel, we said, in both dispensation, of, in both dispensation of conscience and innocence, and the third dispensation is human government. Man was privileged now to govern himself, right? Privileged to govern himself. So before he was innocent. There was no sin. Then, after they fell, there was man was now expected to live by their conscience and offer, do what is right by their conscience and offer God blood sacrifice. But we recognize that man failed in doing that. So now, on to the third dispensation. Let us look what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 8, 14 through to 21. And in the second month, on the, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, O forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons, and thy son's wife with thee, bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both full and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his son's wife with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kind went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took every clean beast, every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offering on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet smelling savor and the Lord said, this in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore, anymore everything living as I have done. While the earth, while the earth remaineth, While the earth remained, seed time and harvest and cool and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Right. So Noah went forth out of the ark. Noah went forth out of the ark and his wife, his son's wife and his sons and all the animals that were with him, they came out of the ark. Right? And the first thing that Noah did 
And I like the first thing that Noah did. The first thing that Noah did, the Bible said that he built an altar. No, when he built the altar, the Bible said he made an offering of, of, of fowls and he made an offering of animals. It meant that the animal would have then be breathing on the ark. And so he was able now to make an offering unto God. So the first thing that Noah did was that he made an offering unto God. So he went forth from the ark unto a purged earth. He went forth unto, from the ark unto a purged earth. Right? And the earth was purged. There was no more sin. God, every, 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 all of the sinful persons on the earth were destroyed by the flood. The animals were destroyed by the flood. And it was only Noah and his family. It seems as if at this time it was like a new earth that God prepared for Noah and his family. And one would think that because sin was basically eradicated by the flood that there would have been no sin but we have come now to understand that the fallen nature of man with the fallen nature of man there will always be sin so noah was the key man between the dispensations right there is always a key man when we look at the dispens the dispensation of innocence and adam was the key man because adam was the one that god taught how to made Sack to mix sacrifice. This is what I require, and God taught Adam what to do. And there is no doubt that in the dispensation of conscience, Adam taught his sons. So it is now that in the dispensation of from the dispensation of conscience to the dispensation of human government, Noah was the man. Amen. He was the man between both dispensations. He was a key man, so to speak. He was the man that God chose. And, and when we will finish, I will point out three things that we need to note as we go through the dispensation. And one of them is that we must know the key man, the man that God always used. Between each dispensation, there is always a man. And God will choose a man to represent him. And so what God did at this time was choose Noah. Noah was the key man, right? And he lived in the age of conscience, like I said, when the human race began to be so corrupt to provoke the, the judgment of the Lord. He also passed through the judgment and lived in the opening days of the dispensation of human government. So the dark shadows brought about by sin of humanity before the flood were brushed away, you know, like I was saying. By the grace of God, God wiped away everything. What they were doing at that time, God wiped away everything and he purged the earth. There was a new earth, so to speak, for Noah and his family to enter in. And this family enjoyed a completely new beginning in a new earth with unlimited opportunities. But with great responsibility because God gave Noah and his sons the responsibility to maintain the order, to, 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 to keep the people in line, to do what is expected of them. They had a great responsibility, right? And so everything was swept away during the flood. And Noah and his sons and his son's wife and his wife came out into a new world. So like I said, I like in particular that the dispensation started out with Noah making sacrifice, right? And Noah built an altar, we read it, built an altar unto the Lord and took off every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offering on the altar. And the Lord smelled it. You can imagine with the first thing that, that Noah did which, mean, which meant that Noah would have learned what he was supposed to do from under the dispensation of conscience. So the first thing that he did when he descended the ark was to build an altar. And he offered, and when God smelled it, the Lord said in his heart, I will not again 
curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man. And he said, as long as the earth remain, seed time will be their harvest, right? Heat and summer and winter and day and night shall God decide that because the, the offering that God smell was so sweet, the Savior was so sweet that, you know, God just said, look here, these are the things that, you know, I am going to do. So immediately after, after he descended from the ark, he built an altar, right? And God was pleased with his sacrifice. So we said the new dispensation began with an altar because this was the first thing that, that Noah did. Noah built an ark. Right? So the paragraph described the circumstances under which the dispensation of human government began. The first thing that we noticed was that he built an altar. You know, when man sinned, God sacrificed an animal to appraise his wrath, right? To appease his wrath, sorry. In, it was a principle that was established from in Genesis when Adam sinned and it continued, continued during the dispensation of conscience and it continue in the dispensation of human government. The first thing that happened was that Noah did that. So, let us go to the next slide. After the sacrificial offering, God proposed a covenant between Noah and himself, right? He proposed a sacrifice between Noah and himself. The covenant is a mutual agreement. A covenant is a mutual agreement between parties, right? So if, if, if two persons have a discussion and they say, this is what we are going to do, it is a covenant, right? And the, the vow that they made, right, would, would, would hold the two individuals together, right? And the agreement would be like, like a contract. Nowadays, what the, you would go to a lawyer and the lawyer would draft a contract between two parties. That, so you're going to do some business, you go to the lawyer, the lawyer draft up a contract. But before, when there was no lawyer, what took place was that the two individuals would agree. Sometimes a stone was used and they said, based upon this stone, it is agreed that, you know, this is the understanding between us. And so God he proposed a covenant between Noah and himself, right? And we said the covenant is a mutual agreement between parties. The agreement provided not only Noah and his family, but it provided for all creation. The agreement provided not only for Noah, but for the entire creation. Through it, God promised that he would never again curse the ground or destroy all the inhabitants on the earth by floodwaters, right? And the Bible in 2 Peter 3, 6 to 7, let us find that, you know, talks about this, that God will not destroy the earth again with water, but by fire. So because of this thing that, that Noah did the offering that God offered Noah, and this is why it's important for us to give God our entire being in worship. This is why it is important for us to commit ourselves to God because no, it is not a sacrifice in terms of the killing of an animal, but no, is a living sacrifice, and that is why the Bible says that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, a holy in thoughts, holy and pure in body, right? So the, 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 the sacrifice, the offering that Noah made to God, made God know, just said, Noah, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And these are the things that will happen. So God said that I will not destroy the earth again with, with water. So Peter said, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with waters, perish. So that was during the dispensation of conscience. You know, the, the, the Peter is talking now about the judgment. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, which is the one that we live on, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly 
men. So God will not now destroy the earth again with flood. And this was what God, the covenant God made with Noah because Noah gave that offering. He gave that sacrifice, the first thing that he did. So prior to the flood, man's diet was man's diet was vegetable he, he, he ate he, he, he was a vegetarian so to speak right and from that time forward he was permitted this was again because of the sacrifice the offering that noah gave unto god covenant now this you know, again you know and god from this time forward, God permitted the eating of flesh, eating of the flesh of animals. If the blood was properly drained, if the blood was properly drained, so God said, look here, this, because the offering, this is what we're going to do. And then he also instituted capital punishment, right? Let us go to Genesis chapter 9. Let us go from verse 4 through to verse Six, right and then the lord said no but the flesh with the life thereof that is the blood you know thereof shall not shall he not eat and surely your blood of your lives will i require at the end of every beast i will require it and at the end of man at the end of every man's brother will i require the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Yes, so we can go back to the slide. So God now instituted capital punishment because before. The, 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 the killing of Abel, there was no record of murder. And then, even after that, there was still no record of murder. But we could, we could assume that murder took place after Cain, Cain, from Cain descendants. We could assume that more murders took place, right? And then now, we see now in the new dispensation, God now put capital punishment in place. We him said, look here, if a man kill a man, that man's blood will be required of him. In other words, if the man take a man's life, his life is also required. And if we look right across the world, you know, right now, hanging is still on our books, but it's just that we don't hang people anymore. And if some places in the, in, in the world, they still deal with capital punishment, So God know because of what Noah did in that he offered him a burnt sacrifice. God know the covenant with, 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 with Noah. And God used a seal to, to seal the covenant in the terms of a rainbow. He said, anytime you see this rainbow, remember that I will not destroy the earth again with a flood. So anytime you see the rainbow, you know, we have a, we're having a lot of rains. And sometimes you look out there and see the rainbow. You just remember, it just come to mind. God said that he will not destroy the earth again by flood. And it's something that still lingers with us. So God sealed the covenant with a rainbow, right? And we recognize even in today that folks are trying to use the rainbow to symbolize their own thing when God used that as a covenant to say, look here, this is what we're going to use it to seal. Right? So, all that Noah and his descendants had to do now, look at the duty, was to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. God said, look here, replenish the earth, subdue it, rule over it, right? And, and go forth and reproduce. This was all that man had to do in the dispensation of human government, you know. God did not ask them to do anything hard, right? 
all you have to do is to repopulate the earth. Hallelujah. But, but and, and one would ask, what is it so hard in this to do? Live your life pleasing to God and just repopulate. But man had a difficulty. And that is what I'm saying. And that is why I started off with the question. What is it, you know, about man? Why is it that 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 that, that after man fell, it seems like you know anything God tell him to do, it is hard for, for him to do. It is hard for him to live by. So man's duty was supposed to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And that is found in Genesis chapter 9, verse 7. Noah's descendants were to be scattered over the earth and exercise authority over every part of creation. But again, we see the humanistic reasoning, right, behind these people. They decided to do differently from what they were commanded to do. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wife began to repopulate the earth, right? They started to repopulate. Shem would become the father of the Mediterranean region, dwellers and eventually the Jews, right? And Ham descendants spread into Africa and, and Japheth into Europe. Right? So now let us go to point three, which talks about the failure to obey God's command. Yet, God gave a command, replenish the earth, subdue it, go all over the earth, and, and multiply. Right? But the people refused to do that. Right? And in the Bible, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Right? So because... I've seen the sinful nature that was inherited by man. It seems as if every time God said, this is what you're supposed to do. There is something in man that is willing to push against what God tell him to do. And the Bible in Romans 5 verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all man, for all have sinned. So brethren, we have no excuse, right? Because we must recognize that we are sinners and that we are in sin, right? And so, this death from Adam passed down to all men. And it seems as if there is just something in man that says, you know, let us go against God. So, we see where the human nature still came out the fallen nature still came out and by one man sin entered the world and from that until now it just seems like man is on a downward trajectory right so even though noah had a rich experience of riding up on the judgment waters of the flood securely it kept in god's heart he was kept out of the judgment, kept through the process. He had seen the terrible result of sin and the wrath of God poured out in judgment. We find the appearance again in, of sin in the new dispensation. Again, we come back to the fallen nature of man. God purged the earth and removed everything that, you know, is sin. But... Because of the fallen nature, we recognize that man still fell back into sin. Let us look at Genesis chapter 9, 22-24. So notice the statement concerning Noah's sin in chapter 9 of the book, right? Noah began to be an husbandman and he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent and ham the father of canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without and shem 
And Jaffa took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went in backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. First of all, Noah was guilty. The first mention we have of sin after the earth was purged was from Noah. Noah lived under the dispensation of conscience. He saw what God did if persons continued in sin. And Noah, it, he was the first one with which sin was mentioned. The Bible says that he was an husband man. He planted a vineyard, planted, and then when he was through planted and, 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 and fruit beer, he made wine. And after he made wine, he drank until he was drunk. So sin first appeared with Noah. Let us go to the next slide. Drunkenness, brethren, was, is a sin. Right? Alcohol can have such an effect of an individual that it impairs their better judgment. Alcohol can be such an effect on individual, negative effect, that the effects may have to be treated like a disease. I have seen bridging where individuals lose their family, they lose their job, they lose their children because of alcohol and Noah the man that God gave responsibility was the first man that sin was mentioned with after the flood so Noah was guilty of drunkenness. Noah's, Noah's sin was, was twofold. He was first of all guilty of drunkenness. And two, he was unable to discharge the obligation. Noah's drunkenness him incapacitated him to discharge his obligation which God placed upon him. God had placed upon him the responsibility of human government and when he was drunk, he was not able to carry out this obligation. Right? And, and these obligations God gave to him. So now when we look at the attitude of Noah's son, right? Ham saw, the Bible says, saw his father's nakedness. And he mocked him when we read the scripture. And the Bible says that Ham saw his father's nakedness and he told his two brethren without. The, the Bible says that when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his younger son had done to him. Right? And one who just read the passage and seemed to think that, you know, his son came in. And, and, and saw him. But what his son did was that his son mocked him. This man is telling us what we should do. This man is telling us what God requires. Right? He's telling us that, you know, these are the things that we're supposed to do. But yet, look at him. He's in a drunken stage. This was really the kind of mocking that Ham did to his father, you know. There was evidence of a lack of respect, a lack of parental respect on Ham's part. 
when he saw the condition of his father. The only redeeming thing about the situation is that Ham's two brothers refused to participate in Ham's sin. And out of respect for their father, they put a cloak behind them. They walk in back way and they cover their father so as not to look at their father's nakedness. Ham's brother covered their father's nakedness without looking on him. But for Ham, he made a mockery of his father because his father got drunk. Just as soon as Noah planted the vineyard, raised some grapes, and made some wine, he got drunk. After the reappearance of sin, man's heart was drawn further away from the will of God. In fact, in the time of human government, it was characterized by great idolatry and moral degradation. All right, let us continue. Now we want to look at the influence of Nimrod, and this is found in Genesis chapter 10, 8 to 10. Why is it important for us to look at the, the influence of Nimrod? We recognize that after Noah's sin, that man's heart began to stray away from what God wanted them to do, right? And Nimrod was a great influencer in this. I want us to note that the Bible mentioned Nimrod before we get to Genesis chapter 11, where the Bible, where the people stand in open defiance against God, right? So Nimrod was mentioned before, in Genesis chapter 10. And there was a reason why the Bible mentioned Nimrod. Amen. So. And Cush, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Where it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And he wrecked her, her edge. And Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. When we read the passage, the agricultural society did not continue as we knew it in that time, right? Um, it's of human government. In Genesis chapter 10, we notice that sometime after Nimrod's children began to populate the earth, and something definitely happened to change the order of the day, right? And we look at, at the verse. So if we read the passage of scripture without duly thinking of what the Bible is saying. We might have the idea that Nimrod was a mighty hunter. He was killed in deer hunting. He was killed in, in hunting wild goat. And if we read and just read like that and think that he was a mighty hunter, we'll say, yes, he was killed at all these things. But when we dig into the scripture, when we look into the scripture, we recognize, right, that the root word for mighty means that he was a tyrant. Who is a tyrant? A tyrant is a person or a ruler who, 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 who rules absolute, right? Unrestrained by law or constitution. So whatever God put in place now, right? 
Nimrod did not care about what God put in place. He did not care about what human government had to say. He was an absolute ruler. He, he was unrestrained by law or constitution. He was one who ruled with absolute power, oppressive power, brutal power, which means if you don't do what I say, then you are going to be in problem. It is also believed that he was giant in size. His personality matched his physical stature. Because when we read twice that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, the word hunter does not refer to an individual who hunts animal but it refers to an in individual who conquers men. Some theologians have it that <clears throat> the people who wanted to serve God, these were the people that Nimrod hunted. So in essence, he hunted the souls of men. Anybody who was saying, God, this was who Nimrod chose to conquer and said, look here, I am the man. You could say Nimran was a powerful potentate, right? And there is every reason to believe that he set up himself as king. He established his kingdom in the city of Babel, which later became the empire of Babylon, which God himself had to destroy because of its rebellion against him. Right? So Nimrod was this kind of person. You have to do what I say. I want us to know, Bridging, that he was the influencer in the people deciding that they were going to build a city and a tower. He established his kingdom in the city of Babel. He unites the people And the people came to the point and they said, this is what we are going to do. We are going to build a temple. We are going to build, sorry, a, a city. And we are going to build a tower that reach up into heaven. So Nimrod was a powerful individual. He established his city, his kingdom in, in, in Babel, which later became the Babylonian Empire, which God himself had to destroy because of its rebellion against him. What we have seen from the passage indicates the trend of the course of the dispensation of human government. Nimrod began to rule the people with an iron fist. So Noah's descendants did not scatter and fulfill and fill the earth, sorry, as God had commanded them. Let us go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. So the people were supposed to scatter and, 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 and fulfill the plan of God, you know, repopulate the earth. But the people did not do that. And the whole earth, the Bible says, was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of China and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone. And slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad. And the 
upon the face of the whole earth. So Noah's descendants did not scatter and fulfill God's command. Thus feeling in their responsibility in this dispensation. So now let us look at the open rebellion. They said, let us build a tower. And what is the reason? Let us build a tower. Let, they, they, they decided that they were going to make bricks. And they put heat on them and they made mortar from slime. And they said, no, let us build a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad. So the very same thing that God was saying, that, look, you need to go out and you need to multiply, you need to replenish. The people were saying, let us build a tower, let us, let us build a city, let us get a name for ourselves that we don't be scattered abroad. This was the reason why they built the tower, you know, in order they, that they might stay together. Was there anything wrong with it? Yes. There was something wrong with it. Because God had said, you must go forth and replenish. Your responsibility in this dispensation is to scatter abroad scatter all over the earth. The, the ark land and Mount Ararat and they journeyed only a few miles in the plain of Shinar when they decided that they would settle there. But God had said, I want you to scatter all over the earth, multiply, replenish, fill it up. That, you, that is your responsibility in this dispensation. And they said, we are not going to do it. We are going to stay here. There's a passage that said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Every time God says, do something, man decide to go against what God wants him to do. Here again, we see the heights of disobedience. We see the heights of rebellion. What did we say rebellion was? And we recognize that in the dispensation of, consent, of conscience, there was rebellion on Cain's part. Oh, Jesus. And we recognize that now in this dispensation, there was heights of rebellion. Why? Because rebellion is knowing what is required and refusing to do it. The people knew what was required of them and they refused to obey the command of God. God did not say, go and move mountain. He did not say swim the widest ocean. All he said, replenish the earth. Scatter and fill the earth. This is what he commanded the people. And the people decided underneath the influence of Nimrod that they were going to build a city, that they were going to stay in one place so that they can have, have an identity And have a name for themselves. So Nimrod was the instigator for building the city and the tower. His name mean we will revolt or we will rebel. So he was the instigator to have the people to build a tower, symbolizing their rebellion against God. 
he was the one that instigate the people in building a city. That represented rebellion against God. His name means we will revolt or we will rebel. The Bible says Nimrod founded his kingdom in Shinar with several large cities. Using his influence, he began building a great city for the protection of the people. He told the people that he's going to build the city for their protection. So we said the beginning of the city, the, 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 he had different cities, but this city somehow would be one that would, would cement him as, so to speak, the sole leader. This meant that if a person committed murder and that person's blood is required of them, they could have gone to the city and not be killed. Nimrod was a murderer right now. And he was the one, remember God said, God instituted capital punishment and he was a murderer and he was the one that was leading the people. This is to tell us how far the people had gone at that time. Because if God said, look here, if this man kill, his blood will be required of him. And the people had this man leading them, this man who killed people, this man who hunted the souls of men. This tower in Nimrod mine would be too tall for the water to reach. So in his mind, he was saying that if, if a flood come again, this tower will keep the people safe because the water will not reach up there. Would he turn? Men from the fear of God to a dependence upon him. So the people look to this man. They look to him for leadership. They look to him for solution to their problems. They look to him for solution to calm their fears. They look to him for everything. The tower would be the center of religious activities while Nimrod became the overseer of both political and religious system. It's so familiar. Thus, he represented the first type of Antichrist. So his plan was to rule because when he built the city and the tower, you know, the tower would be part of not only if there was a flood, but a part of how they worship. And the, thus represents the first type of Antichrist. He would be in charge of the worship. He would be in charge of the government. Virgin, as I speak, do we know that there are folks who are behind a one world government? There are folks who are behind a one world religion. And there is coming a time when it is going to happen. The Bible says, He who know let it and will let her, he who no restraints until he be taken out of the way, then shall, shall the son of perdition be revealed. And when the church is taken out of the way, we are going to see a man coming on the scene that has answers to the world problem. He's going to solve what is happening in the Middle East. He's going to bring peace in the Middle East. 
is going to have an answer for all of the questions. There will be sign and wonder with this man. This man will be the Antichrist. But Nimrod was a form of the Antichrist. So Noah's descendants, we see, did not scatter. And fill the earth as God had commanded them. Thus, feeling in their responsibility in this dispensation. A simple task, replenish the earth, scatter. And the people with this, even though they were influenced, they refused to do what God commanded them to do. Now, let us look at the judgment that was and then out. The people under the influence of Nimrod began to build a city, right? And we mentioned that, right? And that is found in Genesis chapter 11, 5 to 9. Let us find that passage. Gen let's start from verse 4, right? So the people under the influence began to build the city and a tower. And they said, go to let us build a city. And a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is of one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confirm their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from, from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build, left off to build the city. In other words, they stopped from building the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confirm the language of all the earth, and from thence the, did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So the people under the influence of Nimrod began to build a city and a tower. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and thus whatever they set out to do, they will accomplish. Right? And nothing will be restrained from them, the Lord said, which they have imagined to do. So anything the people imagined to do, the people would have accomplished it. Right? They, 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 they started under the influence of Nimrod to build a city, to, to build the tower. And God recognized that the people were one and that whatever they thought to do, that they would have accomplished it. And the Lord said, you know, let me intervene. So God brought the construction to an halt. Right? Um, creating different languages. Up until this time, the earth had one language, and the Lord confounded them by changing of the language and enforcing his command to fill the earth. The result was the rise of different nations, cultures. From that point on, human government has been a reality. In other words, when the people were dispersed, human government was still what they were ruled by and even up until today we are still under human government because we are ruled by men right so to enforce his command god divided humanity into different language groups and god put it in them if you speak spanish you you, you will want to go to a particular place and if you speak 
English, you will go to a particular place. And if you speak, speak something else, you will go to a particular place. And God, God when he changed the language, he put the desire in them for them to move out to separate place. He enforced his command. You know, his sovereign will, you know, must be done. But have we noticed, right, in these last and closing days that the language barrier is broken, right? So we might just think that, um, you know, and, and technology, technology is good. Don't get me wrong. So we might think that, well, you know, it is amazing what man can do because, you know, we can just talk into a phone and we just select Chinese and the phone translate it. To Chinese or the Chinese can speak and we translate it to English. Virgin, I want us to understand that the language barrier is broken. Yes, there is a need to communicate. So in, in purchasing things, some of the time I speak directly to somebody that is a Chinese and this person can speak good English. If there's a problem, I can just call that person on WhatsApp. And I cannot speak Chinese, but she can speak English good and she understands everything that I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there are countries who have taken the step to teach their, their people the English language. Do we know that the English language is the leading language in the world? Almost every country is... It is one of the things that is happening in our country, you know, is that the teachers of English have migrated to other countries because steps are being taken to teach their population English. So a lot of English teachers have migrated to Japan, to China, and to other places. Because they have taken the step to teach their people English. While we in the third world country will not take much steps. Yes, we will sometimes try to see if we can learn Spanish. But English is the number one language in the world. And so what man has done now to break the barrier is to design an app. If the thing is even written in Japanese, I, I have a car radio and I don't understand anything on the car radio. And I just call my son and my son just take out him phone. Boom, and him just take the picture. And when him take the picture, the phone translates everything. You could understand what to press and, and to navigate the radio from you know, just putting the phone even over what is written in Japanese. And a man, I, I, I was amazed. And I'm saying to us that the language barrier is broken. The same thing that God said, look here, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to confound, confound these people by changing up their language and send them into different parts of the world. So we are thinking that, yes, man is great, but it's, it, is, it is more than that. It is man saying to God, that God, this barrier that you put in, we are able to break down this barrier. So the effort to break down the barrier from that time until now has reached a far away brethren. And the language barrier is broken. There is an effort, and we've seen it, to break it. And it says to us that the coming of our Lord Jesus is nearer than we think. The breaking down of the language barrier is nearer than we think. Why is it that You find it hard to believe that there is a man that will come that will rule the entire world. And yes, these are those ways to devise. Remember, it's the same thing that was happening in at the Tower of Babel. 
and and God said, look here, one man rule it. And God said, me going to change the language. And God put a halt in the one world government system. He put a halt in the one world religion. And men are behind the scene working to undo the very thing that God did. And brethren, the language barrier have been broken. Amen. Amen. And it means that we need to recognize that we are much nearer to the coming of the Lord than we think. In time past, if somebody from the Chinese, they were coming to Jamaica, they would have to have an interpreter. No, the Chinese, they are coming here, they don't need an interpreter because they can't talk English. But no one is afraid to go to another country right now. Because if they don't speak English, they have the app. My God, I went to, to a Spanish-speaking country, you know, sometime during the year. And we have the app. We could just say something and the app translate to the folks. I'm saying to us that we, this, this is telling us that we are nearer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ than we think. So let us look at point five, the mode of deliverance, right? So we said with every dispensation, there is a mode of deliverance, right? And in the dispensation of innocence, we say that, you know, to, to appease the wrath of God, he slew the animal and he used the blood to appease his wrath. Remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So the blood was shed in the dispensation of human uh, uh, of sorry of conscience god used the ark as a mode of deliverance now when we come to the dispensation of human government there is also a mode of deliverance remember we said that salvation is always by the grace of almighty god the bible tells us for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So during the dispensation of conscience, we recognize that the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. So under Nimrod's leadership, under Nimrod's rule, remember we said that he was a tyrant. He was an absolute ruler unrestrained by law or constitution. He was a ruler who exercised absolute power oppressively or brutally. So he oppressed the people. He brutally ruled the people. If you don't do what I'm saying, it seems it, it comes like some of these folks know that, you know, rule in in certain certain garrison era if you don't do what them say they broke your hand or broke your foot and you have to fall in line right so the, this was the way that nimrod ruled so i want us to know bridging that nimrod was the instigator like we said you know for building the city and for building up the tower he wanted to become the overseer of both the political and the religious system he he set up himself as the one, the city and the tower was just a way of confirming in, confirming him as the person. You are the man. And this is the city that says you are the man. This is the tower that says you are the man. So this is what he was, was going to do because he was ruling other cities already. So God's plan was not only to judge the people, oh, bless the name of Jesus Christ, but also to deliver the people from under the rulership of Nimrod. He ruled with an iron fist. He, Nimrod ruled with an iron fist. And God planned to deliver the people to judge the people 
and to deliver the people from under the rulership of Nimrod. God not only wanted to judge the people, but to deliver the people, one, from the rulership of Nimrod, and two, for, from his own wrath, for disobeying him. So the people disobeyed God by staying in one place. And God wanted to deliver the people. They were oppressed. They were doing it because of Nimrod. So what God did in delivering the people, the same thing that God used to judge the people was the same thing that God used to deliver the people. Nimrod opened having a one world government and a one world religion was brought to an halt by the intervention of God. The same thing God used to judge was the changing of the language so the people did not understand understood what understood each other and the same thing that he used to judge was the same thing that he used to deliver the people from the rulership of Nimrod and from his own wrath for disobeying him. Nimrod's hope of, of achieving the one world government was, was, was put on hold. His hope to achieve one world religion was put on hold. So with the closing of each dispensation and the beginning of the new one, we should closely observe three things. Right? The first thing we should observe is that God have one man which singles out to represent him during the transition between the passing dispensation and the incoming one. For example, when we look at the dispensation of conscience and the dispensation of human government, we recognize that God had Noah as this person. So the dispensation was about to pass and then there the new one. Then secondly, we should observe certain others or commandments that, you know, of the past in dispensation that are brought over into the new dispensation, right? And thirdly, we should carefully list the new things introduced with the new dispensation. Yeah, so that is it. So, God has this one man which singles out to represent him during the transition and for the dispensation of conscience and human government. That was Noah, right? Then, let's go to the next slide now. So, certain orders are commitment. We said that, you know, pass from the dispensation, which is brought into the new. We should take note of that we should carefully list the new things introduced in the new dispensation. So, for example, like after the flood, God said, look here, capital punishment. And that was brought over into the other dispensation. Still have capital punishment now, like I said, right? And then the dispersing of people from Babel, so we're still talking about the mode of deliverance, right? We said God delivered the people from under the rulership of Nimrod, but the dispersing of the people from the Tower of Babel was a way for God to single out the next man to carry into the other dispensation. Amen? So just as we singled out Noah, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. He delivered the people from under the rulership, for under the tyrant. Deliver them from that, and he dispersed the people. And in the disbursement, the disbursement of the people, God was able to single out a man that he would use in the next dispensation. And this is why when we jump from Genesis chapter 11 
to Genesis chapter 12. And when we come back the next time, we will look at that. We recognize that the Bible says, God now called Abraham. Or Abraham at that time, God called him from the land of the Chaldeans. Right? And God said, come on and, and I'll take thee to a place that I will show thee. So Abraham was this man now from the dispensation of, of, of human government into the dispensation of promise. And next week when we come, we will get into the dispensation of promise. But let us now look at point six. One or two takeaways from the dispensation. So for this dispensation, we will have one takeaway. And there's one thing that I would want to point out. And this is that of unity. So remember now in Genesis chapter 11 verse 6. I have it there. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they have all one language. And this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So yes, the scripture is talking about individuals going against the will of God but the thing to note is that the people have one mind the people were one and because they were one the very God of heaven came down and said because these people are one they will accomplish what they set out to accomplish God of heaven said that you know because the people are one, brethren, they will accomplish what they set out to accomplish. I want us to know, brethren, that there is power in unity. When we come together, we can achieve anything. When we come together, we can achieve anything. It was God's sovereign will for the people to scatter and to multiply, right? But then when we work together as individuals, when we work together as a family, we can achieve anything that we set out to accomplish. And the unity starts with the family. I want us to know, Virgin, that if we have uh, families that are united, husband and wife, children that are united. We will have churches that are united. We will have communities that are united. I am not sure what, 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 why is it that people find it so hard to live together? Yes, we, we, we know that we are of different background and different training and, and, and different, but why is it that we find it so hard to live together in unity? When there is a mindset of unity, when there is a mindset of working together, anything can be achieved. And it starts with the family. Too often, the husband is pulling to one direction and the wife is pulling to the next direction. The Bible said the twain has now become one. Why is it that husbands and wives find it so hard to pull together? So, husband and wife working, yes, and one is saying, this is my money, and the next one is saying, this is my money, and there is no combining. And you find that even though both parties are working, there is still a financial strain on the family. They're not united in, in how they deal with their finances. They, they are not united in how they deal with matters as it arises in the house. And if the husband and the wife can work together. We will have communities where people are united. We will have communities where the churches are united. Too often the husband is pulling in one direction, the wife is pulling in the next direction. Irrespective of the challenges that the marriage face, if the husband work together, if and the wife work together, 
if they come together, believe in God, praying, believe in God together, working together, they can overcome the challenges. If the family is united, brethren, then we will have a united church. It starts with the family. Then the community would be united. It starts with the family. The family. So, Bridget, this is something that we need to work on as a people of God. So, unity is important to a growing church. So, if the church is going to grow, Bridget, then unity is important. It keeps the church body growing, maturing, and working at its fullest. Right? So, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, Right? He said, just as the body is one, but has many members, all these parts are one body, so it is in the body of Christ. So we are different members, brethren, coming together. Different background we're coming from, but we're coming together in the body of Christ. But it is one body. Why is it that we're behaving as if it is two different bodies? It is your body and the body of Christ. No, it is one. And the body, the, 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 the brain cannot say, I have no use for the mouth. Or I have no use for the eyes. Because the entire body is dependent upon the parts. And they work together in coordination to achieve what the brain wants. So it is important to the growing church. So though we are different, you know, from different backgrounds, we come together to form one body. This is why, you know, the Bible says, you know, um, for he ascended upon high and he led captivity captive and gave gift unto men. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we what? Come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the statue of the fullness of Christ. The first thing the Bible mentioned in verse 13, it is till we come in the unity of the faith, So the unity for the church to grow, it is important. And bridging, we cannot be in church and we're in malice. We cannot be in church and we're, in, we're not talking to each other. We cannot be in church and the church is pulling. Listen to this. The church is pulling to, to on a building fund drive. And there are still folks in church who have never given a dollar. But they, when the building come through, when God provides somewhere, these people would want to rejoice with everybody as if. And if the church is, we, we can't have members. And we said, this is what we are going to try and accomplish. And you are against it we're not united and if we're not united we're not we are not going to achieve remember god said these people are one and because they are one they will accomplish what they set out to accomplish so unity is important bridging to the growing church right unity keeps christ at the center. It is God's plan. To bring unity to all things. In heaven and earth. Under Christ. Right? It is not about me. It is not about myself. It is not about I. Right? My plans. My desire. My preference. My agenda. No. It is not about me and my feelings. But it is about the gospel. When we become unified around the mission. 
go in there for, teach all nations, baptizing them. When we are unified around the mission, it keeps Christ at the center. It's not about any of us. It's not even about the bishop because it is God's church. And if we are going to fulfill the mission, we have to be united. Unity caused the anointing to flow, brethren. The psalmist said in, in Psalms 133, verse 1, he said, how good, yes, find it. He said, how good and how, and how pleasant it is, brethren. And so we come to church, and when we come to church, Dan not speaking to Jackie. We're just calling random names, right? We're not even sure if anybody in church named Jackie. But we're just calling random names. But look here, two people not speaking and you come to church, you will prevent the anointing from flowing. Brethren, it is the anointing that breaks the yoke. And a lot of time, we come to church, the yoke cannot be break because people in church preventing the anointing from flowing. So he said, how good and how pleasant it is for bridging to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head, glory that ran down upon the beard of Aaron's beard, that went down even to the skirt of his garment. Bridging, it is God that is the head of the church, you know. And, and if we, it, it, the anointing is ready, he said, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion, for dear the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So, brethren, we come to church with our ism and schism, and we stop the anointing from flowing. We stop the anointing, bless the name of God, from flowing when we come in with, with ism. And we excuse him. So it's God that is the head, ready for ready to anoint the body. Guess what happened? The body disjointed. So when it's supposed to run down off the neck and go on the shoulders, the shoulder disjoint, so it's not running down. So some folks under the anointing, some folks feeling God, but some folks dry like chips. If we are going to experience God as a church, as all we are supposed to experience Him, we have got to be united. The anointing region will break chains. It will set captive free. For some folks, it don't matter, you know. But when I am in church and I see person coming to the altar and they leave in the same way they came, Sunday after Sunday, it caused me to wonder where is the power of God that is going to break the yoke? And it is sometime within the camp that we need to look first. AI was a small city and they whopped Israel because sin was in the camp. I'm saying to us, Bridget, put aside the differences, man. Put aside the me, myself, and I and let us come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and worship God and see if the yokes and the bondage will not break. See if persons will not receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Persons will not come to church and leave the same way they came. And this is why, brethren, you don't stay home when you have a situation. You're having a problem, but you're staying home. Home and be among the brethren. The Bible says, forsake not be assembling at yourselves together. Come back to me, myself, and I have a problem, and, and I have to solve the problem. No. Come among the brethren. 
call for your prior partner. And the Bible says, well, one shall chase a thousand. Don't it? And two shall put ten thousand to flight. So if you call a brother to help you pray, a sister to help you pray, you will get deliverance, man. Don't stay at home when you have the situation. Come to church. Come and cry in church. Come and holler at the altar. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So, brethren, unity is a, a, it plays a big part. It plays a great role in the church. Brethren, if the church should achieve what it is that we're going to achieve, if, if we say, yes, we see a piece of land and we're going for the piece of land, Put your heart in it, man. Put your mind in it. Put your resource in it and watch God work. Remember, God will be adapted to no man. So, this is the takeaway, Bridget. Unity is important, right? So, what is it that we can learn about that? Simple. God's sovereign will must be accomplished, right? In Psalms 115, verse 2. Three, right? He said, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. No one man, no nation, no nothing at all can stop God's sovereign will from being accomplished. God said, Look here, multiply. Subdue the earth, replenish the earth, move out into the earth. The people decided to stay one place. So God intervened. And all he did was to change the language. And when he changed the language, his sovereign will was accomplished. To enforce God's command, God divided humanity into different language groups. And his sovereign will to populate the earth was Accomplish. The third dispensation of human government. We recognize failure of man again to observe what God commanded them to do. I thought that I, I think that this command was simple, you know, just go forth and multiply. You know, replenish the earth, and you know, the the and spread out. But even in this, the people failed to do what God commanded them to do. Virgin, I pray that you know, as we try to follow God, as we try to serve, as we try to please the Lord, that we will you know do our best because. You know, as we recognize the dispensation of, of, of innocence, the P, Adam and Eve, they disobeyed the command of God. In the dispensation of conscience, again, the people refused to do what God wanted them to do. And, you know, with the advent of sin in this third dispensation that we look at, mankind went down the slide. They, 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 they Folks at that time, Nimrod wanted to set up himself as the man. In fact, I believe that he was set up as the man. The building of the tower and the building of the city was just a way of confirming that, yes, you are the man. And again, this dispensation, God had to judge them. He had to confound them by the changing of their language. And we see where God selected one man. As we come next week and we look at the dispensation of promise, we, will, we are going to recognize that God now selected another man to carry on. And we are going to look at how that dispensation also ended in judgment. And we are going to look at the means of deliverance. And we pray that you would have been blessed. We pray that you would have learned something. And this is all about, you know, us, you know, Strengthen, strengthening our walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. We pray all being well next week, next time. Next week, same time, same place. We'll be here to 
continue the study. God bless you in Jesus' name. Father, we magnify your name. We give you thanks. Thank you for all you have done. Thank you for what was said. We ask God that, you know, you will cause the word to go forth, to accomplish, to touch hearts. You help us to live in unity, mighty God, to, to be able to accomplish what it is that you want us to accomplish. Lord, as a church, as a family, Lord, as a community, help us to live in unity, Lord Jesus. Um, remove the malice, remove the, 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 the malice from among us and help us to live as you will have us to live. We pray, God, that you'll help us to be true to your words. Help us to obey, God, and do the things that you'll have us to do. Because we have recognized that throughout each dispensation, man has failed to follow what it is that you have laid out for him. But we pray, God, that as the people of God, you will give us the strength to do your will. Have it your own way, we pray, as we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.